to deter samurai from changing sides, which they'd done with some ease in medieval Japan, the notion was introduced that this brought loss of honour. Strong discouragement in a culture of shame, as a distinguished native social critic has called it. Surrender was also deeply shameful. Suicide was preferable, especially since Japanese culture included no prohibition against it. Harakiri came to be regarded as a highly honourable act, reserved primarily for samurai, at the top of the commoner's social hierarchy. But true samurai were never cowardly enough to court or hasten death. Harakiri was appropriate only when every resource had been exhausted and no hope remained to pass yet another test. Thus, suicide was relatively rare, and even rarer in the 17th through 19th centuries, when central control became strong enough to stop almost all feudal fighting and samurai became more bureaucrats than warriors. Still, the practice was celebrated and idealised, chiefly by fervent non-combatants. When the act could be extolled in comfort rather than performed, legends, epics and plays spread its virtues among armchair admirers, much as American westerns would celebrate manly violence. Bushido was propagated far less by men who had to fight to the death or kill themselves than by comfortable fans of the drama. Although its roots went deep, its modern glorification arose after three centuries of peace, when, as Ian Baruma recently noted, the valorous had little else to do but worry about rules, appearances and style. Warriorhood without wars was soon reduced to a set of stylish postures. A strong undercurrent of radical militarism ran close to the surface of Japan's relatively democratic 1910s and 1920s. When it broke through and pushed the country into her imperialist wars, ultranationalists menaced political, social and cultural life, and held up Bushido as a code of national behaviour. Never mind that it had been devised for an elite in individual combat, that it mandated benevolence toward the weak and conquered, or that the feudal code could have rare application in modern combat. The code of Bushido says that a warrior lives, so he is always prepared to die, the non-mystical captain of the light cruiser in Yamato's screen told his crew as they got underway. Nothing has been so abused and misinterpreted as this adage. It doesn't mean that a warrior must commit suicide for some slight reason. It means that we live so that we shall have no regrets when we must die. We must not forfeit our lives meaninglessly. But few Japanese knew the origins or understood the concept. From the 1930s it was exploited by the tyrannous 20th century obscurantism that overwhelmed the nation and hailed war. That distortion elevated death from a slim possibility to a civic or at least a military duty. For half a century, all Japanese schoolchildren dedicated themselves to their emperor every morning, bowing to his imperial majesty's photograph or in the direction of the imperial palace, asked daily to state their dearest ambition. Assembled classes thundered in unison, to die for the emperor. A manual given each army recruit spoke of living and dying with his fellow soldiers. Read this alone, and the war can be won lauded noble death. Corpses drifting swollen in the depths of the sea, corpses rotting in the mountain grass, and extolled its rewards. All military life resounded with the need to die honourably. Do not be afraid of combat and do not come home alive, was endlessly repeated. Whether I float as a corpse under the waters or sink beneath the grasses of the mountainside, went a fighting man's hymn, I will willingly die for the emperor. As Russell Spur put it recently, Johnny never came marching home. The martial songs left him rotting on some foreign field or dying hopelessly in a futile suicide charge. Troops were unceasingly reminded that victory of honour or death of honour were their only alternatives, that sublime willingness to die was essential to the Japanese fighting spirit. Do not disgrace yourself by being captured alive, but die exhorted the imperial rescript for soldiers and sailors. Of course, there were degrees of belief in that. It was iron among the army's backbone of academy graduates, men like Mitsuru Ushijima and Tadashi Kojo. One junior officer of that caste was wounded during the China War. 
A young Chinese officer recognised him as his instructor when he'd studied in Japan and saw to it that the still unconscious Japanese was delivered to a hospital. The rescued man killed himself after his release to atone for the shame of his capture, and Cadet Kojo thrilled to that admirable defence of honour. The belief was weaker among reserve officers, still weaker among the drafted rank and file, and weakest among unmotivated nonconformists, softies and recent conscripts who had hoped to escape the draft. One of the handful of a battalion's survivors on Okinawa would remember the Japanese people wearing two faces during the war's final years. The one turned to others around them said, Fight and die for the country. The other, turned inward and shared by the family, said, Don't die, survive at all costs and come home. Those who did return home to find tear-soaked telegrams mistakenly informing their families of their deaths realised that not all their parents were the uncompromising patriots they'd pretended to be. Norio Watanabe, the anti-war and anti-emperor cult draftee from Osaka, bought no part at all of Bushido. Nothing in army life or philosophy appealed to the former photographer. Just before Pearl Harbour, a fellow journalist risked a treason charge to urge him not to die in the likely imminent war with America, but Watanabe needed no such advice. Photographing for Osaka's General Motors division three years earlier, he'd viewed a company film. Images of its mighty Detroit plants were enough for the misfit to see immediately what the army brass never could. Tacking on America would be madness. The diminutive Watanabe was 30 years old when his despised draft notice finally came, a year before the start of the fighting on Okinawa. Clenching his teeth during basic training, partly to keep them from being broken. He quickly realised that the real reason for his beatings was the army's conviction that fear was the best teacher of obedience. The beaten lose their minds, and loss of mind had taken Japan to the war in the first place. Kenjiro Matsuki was another exception. His divergence from the norm began when he was a youngster in Honshu's impoverished north, where an uncle supplied him with baseballs fished out of a stream that ran from an athletic field to his little farm. Later, Matsuki's strapping size, by Japanese standards, and love of baseball, introduced to Japan in the 1870s by American visitors, won him a scholarship to Tokyo's Meiji University. The team's series against American universities in 1929 was a very exciting experience for the big first baseman, who went on to play on an all-Nippon team that hosted a series against Lou Gehrig and other stars. And during the summer of 1931, he actually danced with a young woman in Hawaii, something he might never have done in Japan outside dance halls with their paid hostesses. Matsuki played for Japan's first professional baseball team when it was formed in 1935, and he went on to captain, then managed the popular Hanshin Tigers. Happy memories of America deepened his sadness at the news of Pearl Harbor. What foolishness to extend the war, already far into China, to mighty America. But his first-hand knowledge of the enemy was exceptional among Japanese soldiers on Okinawa, and the uncommonly individualistic Watanabe would demonstrate that he was an even rarer exception. Although few ordinary Japanese soldiers believed the whole of their military indoctrination most preferred death to the intolerable shame of surrender. The sullen, broken sprinkling who had surrendered in Pacific battles preceding Okinawa were convinced they could never return disgracefully alive to face the humiliation awaiting them at home, where their names would have been stricken from their villages' lists, their manhood forever effaced. Americans took that for fanaticism, but it may have been closer to a poetic passion that welled up beneath the reserved Japanese countenance. It was a triumph of emotion over logic, like Japan's decision to attack America. But whatever its source, the heightened willingness to die was among the factors that made the Pacific War supremely brutal. Soldiers everywhere continued killing until they were beaten. The Japanese soldier wasn't beaten until he was killed. Together with willingness to die, Another important national trait helped ease the army's way to its atrocities against allied prisoners of war. 
Japanese children were raised to develop keen sensitivity to a complex web of duties, debts and obligations that governed their society, all involving subtle rules and nuances that varied with time, place and status. As Ayan Baruma observed, it's almost essential to be brought up Japanese in order to acquire that sensitivity, to have one's brains plugged into the social computer bank, as it were. But what of people who were outside the local and national communities, foreigners in the first instance? The Japanese tendency was to feel no restraints when dealing with them, because the elaborate web didn't stretch that far. When a Japanese is unplugged by going abroad, for instance, the computer can go berserk, for unlike Christian morality, the Japanese code isn't thought to be universal, it applies only to Japanese. On top of that, many Japanese soldiers despised men for allowing themselves to be taken. Some believed beheading was an act of compassion that ended the prisoner's intolerable disgrace. How much better to give a prisoner a manly death than to prolong his final degradation of the male spirit? It was easy for Americans in 1944 to see Japanese as inherently savage. The handful who knew something about their culture could cite the glorified barbarities, steel swords slashing human bone, that ran through Japanese history. But the country hadn't always mistreated prisoners of war. Defeated enemies sometimes received true Bushido consideration and courtesy, as in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, when treatment of Russian prisoners was often exemplary. In this war, however, Japan was far more brutal than Germany to American POWs. However savage the Nazi occupation was to civilian populations, however monstrous the suffering imposed on Soviet and Eastern European prisoners, Germany treated many Western POWs tolerably, no doubt partly because the thousands of Wehrmacht soldiers in Allied hands were an incentive to observe her obligations as a Geneva Convention signatory. But Japan lost few prisoners to the Allies and cared little for those despicable cowards. The Empire's prisoners were principally English and Dutch soldiers, and colonial administrators captured during her lightning seizures of European colonies in the months following Pearl Harbor. Over a million had died or were painfully dying in their gruesome camps. Many were beaten, beheaded and bayoneted, sometimes when tied between posts. At Milner Bay, the penises of Australian prisoners were cut off and the foreskins sewn to their lips. Then a sign was left for when their comrades retook the territory. What caused such barbarity? Few Americans knew of the ripe hatred in the Japanese memory. American demonstrations of superiority, including opposition to Japan's wish for a racial equality clause in the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, seared and galled. Orientals were made ineligible for American citizenship. California and other states denied them the right to own land and segregated their schoolchildren. The 1924 Exclusion Act was directed specifically against Japanese immigration despite a gentleman's agreement 16 years earlier that had virtually ended it. The gratuitous insults demonstrated that the yellow peril was more in the American mind than in geopolitical reality. The humiliations had begun earlier, at an episode hailed in American history and reviled in Japanese. When Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry arrived to open Japan in 1853, the country had been closed almost hermetically for over two centuries, Sealed borders kept foreigners from entering and natives from leaving, or returning, if they'd been resident abroad. The entrenched isolation magnified the terrifying spectre of Perry's warships in Edo, Tokyo Bay. A letter from well-meaning President Millard Fillmore assured the Emperor that the democratic, peace-loving American Republic recognised Japan's right to govern herself without the slightest interference. But Japan's closure had led to occasional firing on foreign merchant ships in distress and to mistreatment of seamen shipwrecked on rocky coasts, aliens who'd violated the prohibition against entry. Perry had come to end those offences, but more importantly, to secure trading opportunities and coaling facilities and to awaken the Japanese to their Christian obligation to join the family of Christendom which the Secretary of the Navy had confided was the mission's underlying motive. That was nothing to resent, 
presuming that good was served by opening a sovereign nation to America's economic and religious interests. Enlightened Washington did not rely on moral suasion to convince the heathen. The good Christians brought big guns. Blinking at them, the Japanese thought of the Westerners who had forced their way into China just 14 years earlier. They included the British, who instigated the Opium War in annoyance at attempts to restrict the importation of the crippling drug and easily triumphed with their modern weapons. The Chinese Empire's virtual disintegration quickly followed, foreigners extracting concession after concession from the rump. Slicing the Chinese melon, they called it. Perry's demands were moderate, at least in comparison to those the British, Dutch, French and Russians would make in his wake. Since someone was going to pry open the country very soon, better the young republic than the cynical European powers that negotiated more arrogantly and mined concessions more greedily. But it was Americans who arrived first and began the process. An old Japanese folk song had warned of a black ship, an alien thing of evil mien. Two of Perry's black-hulled ships also belched black smoke, the colour by which the vessels instantly became known and remained so by every schoolchild of succeeding generations. The Japanese had never seen steamships. Their shore batteries had no hope against Perry's cannon. The country was submerged in panic and dismay. It would figure little in Japanese memory that Perry's squadron played a crucial part in the country's liberation from an often cruel feudalism whose borders were closed to tighten it. What most Japanese would remember was a devastating blow to national honour, with trespassers getting their way through superior might. The black ships became a national metaphor for a front to sacred Japan. The first sight of Western civilization, up the barrel of American guns, fed the Japanese sense of themselves as being under pressure from those who wished her ill, led by the United States. Roots much deeper in their own history and national psyche fed their glorification of militarism and urged to subjugate others. An old Japanese saying has it that the cherry is the first among flowers as the warrior is the first among men. Still, Perry's presumption and amazing cannon spurred their impatience to build their own. They had good reason to believe that unless they could copy the barbarians' military technology, they'd suffer more such humiliations, maybe even be carved up into economic colonies, as Western powers were doing elsewhere throughout Asia. Memory of the black ships helped feed an appetite for conquest that would end in the Pacific War, when the emotional people, overwhelmed by their rages and fears, perceived Americans as provocative symbols of a detested past, rather than as human beings. A cartoon celebrating Pearl Harbor depicted a dismayed Uncle Sam uncorking a giant samurai from a bottle. Revenge for the black ships. From a barbarous prisoner of war camp, Lorenz van der Post perceived Japan's response as a kind of accumulated revenge of history on the European for his invasion of the ancient worlds of the East and his arrogant assumptions of superiority which had made him use his power to bend the lives and spirits of the people of Asia to the Europeans' inflexible will. Since Perry's arrival, the proud people had been forced to live a kind of tranced life in the presence of the European, who prevented them from being their own special selves with their greatness and illusions. But now the spell was broken, van der Post observed, and the built-up flood of resentment had broken through all restraints, out in full spate, in the open at last, it swept the Japanese, normally so disciplined, but now drunk on what appeared to be invincible military power, into a chaotic mood of revenge. But that couldn't fully explain the barbarity, because more of it was unleashed on impoverished fellow Asians than high-handed Westerners. Japan's slashing and conquering on the Asian continent in the 1930s and 1940s were as bad as the very worst of Western colonialism, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, its hoaxing title for the conquered lands where it sloshed blood and sucked sustenance, spilled over with atrocities. Japanization of inferior Asians included slapping faces in public and murdering citizens, some 10 million, mostly civilian, Chinese alone. 
the conquerors provided an almost spellbinding spectacle of brutality and death, as one historian put it. In 1937, the best Tokyo newspapers reported a friendly competition between two officers to be first to behead 150 Chinese with their swords. As for Americans, Japanese hatred waxed as the war situation worsened. By 1944, magazines were telling their readers that the more American beasts and demons who were sent to hell, the cleaner the world will be. Classroom posters exhorted pupils to kill the American devils. Kill they did. Prisoners of the Japanese were seven times as likely to perish as prisoners in the European camps of the Axis, and the statistics were worse for Americans alone. One percent of American POWs of the Germans died. Forty percent died in Japanese camps. One of the living, who happened to be a knowledgeable admirer of Japanese culture, was made to watch soldiers taking bayonet practice on live prisoners tied between bamboo posts. I would never have thought it possible that in our time there could still have been so many different ways of killing people, from cutting off their heads with swords, bayoneting them in various ways, to strangling them and burying them alive, but most significantly, never just shooting them. The Imperial Army's Wake Island garrison shot over a hundred American construction workers who had been building airstrips there when the Japanese landed in 1941. Japanese pilots shot American pilots dangling in parachutes after bailing out. Their submarines sank a fraction of the tonnage sent under by American submarines, but Allied merchant sailors struggling in the water faced much greater danger. After a Japanese ship transporting American prisoners of war to the mainland was torpedoed, guards struggling to stay afloat, machine-gunned prisoners nearby in the water. Many of the prisoners would have died anyway in airless holds that drove them mad with thirst. Within days of the October 10 raid on Naha, a Japanese submarine's crew laughingly fired pistols and machine guns into the lifeboats of a Liberty ship it had just sunk. The historian John Toland has argued that the Japanese-American War would not have been fought if not for the mutual misunderstanding, distrust and language difficulties, and racial prejudice, irrationality, honor, pride and fear among both peoples. Toland produced much evidence to show that both sides feared things they need not have feared. We were damn fools like they were damn fools, it's enough to make you sick. But even the disastrous American mistranslations of Japanese diplomatic communications he cites can't expunge what did have to be feared. Americans were indeed damn fools, full of frigidity and self retious ignorance of Asia, full of stupid, swaggering insults. But that wasn't the principal cause of the Pacific War, or of its most awful excesses. After Whitaker's two months of infantry training in Camp Lejeune, he was sent to the West Coast in early December 1944, when the 32nd Army's crash programme to build the fortifications he'd face on Okinawa was gaining momentum. The impatient 18- and 19-year-olds on the week-long train ride believed no humans had ever been packed together so tightly. While outside stretched the West's awesome vastness, a new spectacle confirming their country as the world's most blessed and deserving. That strengthened their conviction that Americans were immeasurably more advanced and virtuous than the dirty little bucktooth Japs. More than ever in love with their land of the free, the young warriors bitched about their living conditions, but would never have traded places with the soft civilians who were going to miss the great fight. Righteous vengeance beckoned. Several months after the Philippines had fallen to Japanese forces in April 1942, the US Army learned the fate of prisoners taken there from three officers who managed to escape, but the information was kept secret for fear that its release would bring reprisals upon the surviving prisoners. Only in January 1944 did the American public learn that men dying of thirst were stopped alongside wells and forbidden to drink, that others barely able to stand were booted and beaten that an officer's finger was hacked off when he refused to surrender his wedding ring, that prisoners were forced to bury their comrades alive, and that over 600 Americans and at least 10 times as many Filipinos too exhausted to keep pace on a march from Bataan to a prison compound were clubbed, shot, buried, bayoneted, 
and otherwise tortured to death. American newspapers blistered with outrage and confirmation that the inhuman, barbarous, depraved enemy was a bestial force from some headquarters of evil. Everyone knew some Germans were good, but Japs were a racial menace as well as a dangerous enemy. Cartoons depicted them as mad dogs and hairy tarantulas rightly squashed by combat boots. Under a large photograph of Japanese corpses, a magazine for Marines called Leatherneck ran the caption, Good Japs, keep em dying. Whitaker had read about the Bataan Death March the previous year, but the details still gripped him as his train neared San Diego. Although he knew he'd be facing a devious, cruel, bloodthirsty enemy, he didn't yet know how they fought. He nurtured an assumption that the bow-legged runts in the sloppy uniforms, baggy trousers, ridiculous puttees, couldn't possibly be a match for his spit-and-polish, rough and very ready marines, many of whom would sustain such bravado-laced illusions all the way to the front lines on Okinawa. Green replacements for badly shot-up companies would be rushed in during lulls, and with no time to acquire combat smarts, a shocking number would themselves become casualties within hours. Their platoon leaders would try hard to save them. One hurriedly lectured a new group of bewildered replacements as they huddled together against murderous Japanese fire from the hill nicknamed Sugarloaf. Aching with exhaustion and shock from that day's loss of buddies, the young platoon leader, up from the ranks after all his officers had been shot, concluded by pointing his pistol at the Greenhorns. And if I hear any bullshit about the Japs being lousy fighters, I'll shoot you, he said. If one of you motherfuckers says they can't shoot straight, I'll put a bullet between your fucking eyes before they do. Final Japanese preparations. What chief of staff? Cho whipped the 32nd Army to complete was an unprecedentedly effective complex of fortifications. Much of Okinawa's terrain of sharp rises overlooking flat plains was ideal for defence. Tens of thousands of Japanese soldiers and Korean labourers gasped all day in the sun to improve it with a network of strong points, featuring integrated systems of observation, firepower and reinforcement. Their number and scope far exceeded the much lesser works on Iwo Jima and other islands. For 32nd Army Headquarters, an ancient cave complex beneath Shuri Castle, atop the hill above the normal school, was much enlarged and improved. The main tunnel was 50 feet below ground at its shallowest point. 32 chambers and designated areas along its 1,300-yard length and side shafts accommodated a thousand men, the equivalent of a fighting battalion. They included a dispensary, a kitchen and pantry, a telephony switchboard chamber, weather and typists sections, everything from General Ushijima's quarters to intelligence and operations rooms. The well-stocked pantry was overseen by a chef whom General Cho had brought over from the mainland, together with a supply of fine Scotch whiskey. American intelligence would locate that installation shortly after the start of the fighting, but even the heaviest air and naval bombardments would cause little damage except near one of its concreted entrances. The working spaces would prove virtually impervious to conventional explosives. From the agony of the battle, Japanese soldiers would remember the months of preparation with nostalgia. But now their life was only sweat and tears. Bullying veterans monopolised water, food and every perk. The beatings for slip-ups or bad attitude were even more severe than before because digging put the roughneck senior soldiers in a foul mood. When those vicious gangster-type non-coms, as a junior private called them, were out of earshot, some victims comforted themselves with thoughts of retaliation if the Americans really did land. A few actually looked forward to battle in the hope that anything had to be better than their present misery. Spring brought merciless heat. A large army prodigiously sweating while mixing vast amounts of concrete made water scarcer than ever on the island. We couldn't wash our dishes, our clothes, even our hands after relieving ourselves, a soldier later lamented. The rapid spread of skin infections brought itchy torture even to the few who weren't performing heavy labor. The rations were so meagre that men found picking and eating radish leaves an indescribably happy occasion. 
Cooks ordered them to gather mulberry leaves for mixing into their rice, but the tough greens stuck in their throats. A thin soup, oily with pork fat and dressed with a few pieces of squash, completed the main meal. Still, ordure accumulated so fast that one artilleryman's turn to lug it to a swamp of sewage came every ten days. Why so much waste? Because soldiers couldn't bear their hunger and secretly bought tapioca buns and steamed sweet potatoes from civilians, although one little bun cost a private his daily pay. During a regular first-year soldier training session, a senior private ordered a waste disposal team to fall in with their boots in their hands. The bully scrutinised them, then pointed to Norio Watanabe's. What's this? he thundered. Although Watanabe, the former photographer from Osaka, had cleaned and polished his boots with his usual frightened care, a speck of excrement remained on a heel. Tell me, screamed the senior private, from whom did you receive this item to keep and maintain? As required, diminutive Watanabe replied that he kept and maintained his boots for the emperor. What? You know that and still put shit on it? Lick it off, eat it. Watanabe's hesitation increased his superior's rage. The senior private lashed out with his fists until Watanabe swallowed his new humiliation. No matter what, we must blindly obey everyone of higher rank. The troops were kept at their toil nights as well as days. Caves and more caves were needed for barracks and command posts, for supply and ammunition depots, for a whole strategy and existence based on counter-attack from underground. Thousands of men worked around the clock for nearly a year, enlarging the natural grottos and burrows with which the subtropical landscape abounded. The most elaborate holes had up to four storeys, some supported by timbers and, when there was time, provided with cross-ventilation. Many of the tens of thousands of stone and concrete tombs that dotted the countryside were converted into makeshift pillboxes and fitted out with guns and supplies. Okinawans dug too, some hired, some as conscripts. 39,000 men, every fit male between 16 and 40, were drafted, of whom about a third were used as labourers. 24,000 were issued rudimentary uniforms in the Home Guard, or bow tie. Teenage students assigned to units with no nearby living accommodations had to walk to their stations up to 12 miles every day, to and from home. In the fortified areas, most notable public and private buildings were taken over by the army, the schools usually converted to barracks. Oed children watched growing numbers of soldiers drill on their dusty grounds while their parents wondered whether civilian life would disappear entirely. But there was no alternative to helping prevent Americans from bayonetting their children. Many Okinawans who volunteered or were volunteered through their civic institutions had only hand tools. The 32nd Army's full array of heavy construction equipment consisted of two bulldozers and one earth roller. A million tonnes of dirt were removed from caves in straw baskets balanced on heads and shoulders. New airfields were levelled with pickaxes and hoes. The labouring at Yomitan and Kadena airfields, to which Masahide Ota and other normal school students had been previously assigned, had been a minor preliminary to that massive effort. Where tools couldn't be commandeered from farmers, army officers told civilians to use their bare hands. Many did, including children. The limestone hills were relatively easy to dig into, but the coral, which in many places had a depth of 20 to 60 feet, was harder than concrete. Little dynamite was available. There was no iron for reinforcing concrete and too little concrete itself. Since the October 10th air raid had destroyed most of the gasoline allocated for the 32nd Army's handful of trucks, Millions of timbers for shoring up the caves, tunnels and entry shafts had to be brought down largely by hand from the mountains of the north, then loaded onto little native boats for transporting south. With too little protein and fresh vegetables, civilians grew weak on the relentless labour. Many developed chronic colds and diarrhoea, causing those previously exempted from physical work to be enlisted for the slave labour, as an Okinawan later put it. Like real slave labour, this variety could kill. 
After months of gruelling work in dank caves, or under a burning sun with no rain, men began collapsing. Isamu Cho oversaw the digging, but its mastermind was Ushijima's chief operations officer, Colonel Hiromichi Yahara. A talented tactician with a pragmatic bent, Yahara looked his part as a realist who relied more on his intellect than on a heart stiffened with Japanese spirit. His broad range of planning experience included a year as an exchange officer in America, which helped make him more Western in outlook than the samurai traditionalist Ushijima or the mystically inclined Cho. It also helped make the 32nd Army's leadership Japan's best in the Pacific, although Yahara's dry personality and bent for facts and figures would incline him to clash with the romantically aggressive Cho, his superior. But the two were now almost conspiratorial allies, for the overall strategy of digging deep and counter-attacking from underground shelters was the 32nd Army's largely self-made response to what it knew would be overwhelmingly superior enemy firepower. That fundamentally defensive approach ignored both Japanese military tradition and Ushijima's disapproving superiors in Formosa and Tokyo. Why, the brass challenged, was the 32nd Army so committed to caution? Why was so little of the beach defended? But Ushijima stood his ground, and Yahara continued planning the defence in keeping with his view of war as more science than a test of the opposing army's wills. Colonel Yahara also knew that science started with acknowledging sombre reality. During the 1010 air raid, he'd had three divisions to work with, supplemented by some smaller armoured artillery and service forces, and the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, partly restocked by local conscripts after most of it went down with Toyama Maru. The strongest of those units was the crack 9th Division, whose high morale and long history of combat experience more than made up for its relative lack of heavy armour. The operations chief positioned that backbone of the 32nd Army in the backbone of the defensive position, behind a natural line of high ground protecting Shuri and Naha. That left the 24th Division above the beaches, where Yahara correctly foresaw the Americans would land, and where a heavy concentration of practised artillery would devastate them when they'd be most vulnerable, while discharging their troops and equipment. Then infantry regiments, including Captain Kojo's, would emerge from their bunkers to hit fast and hard in the close combat where Japanese superiority would prevail. Staff officers were supremely optimistic in public, and fitfully so in private. No defenders of previous islands had thrown a landing force back into the sea, but none had been nearly so well prepared. Some understood that such a feat would make no difference in the long run. Eventually, a second or third landing by the enemy would have to succeed, since the defence had so few reserves and no way to replenish supplies that were short to begin with but others hoped a bloody mauling of a major landing would compel America to seek tolerable peace terms instead of inviting worse by invading the mainland. Such illusions soon vanished, however, together with the pleasurable anticipation of obliterating the landing force. The reason was an unlucky guess, or grave miscalculation, by Imperial General Headquarters, which removed the 9th Division to bolster the defence of the Philippines. The division's 25,000 men were shipped in that direction via Formosa in December, but the Philippine cause seemed lost before they completed their trip. Not sent on, they weren't sent back either, partly in fear of more sea travel, partly because Formosa, which Japanese strategists still saw as a more likely next American target than Okinawa, had already been drained in vain support of the Philippine garrison. Ushijima's best division would remain on uninvaded Formosa throughout the rest of the war. Through Yahara, Ushijima had tried to persuade IGHQ not to act on its devastating decision. The colonel argued with logic and passion that no effective defence of Okinawa could be guaranteed without the 9th, and if it had to be withdrawn because the Philippines was to be the decisive battle, General Ushijima preferred to accompany it and die in the fighting there. Ushijima couldn't be optimistic about his answer. During his own Tokyo tours, he'd helped draft telegrams with empty promises of heavy reinforcements to commanders fighting American forces on other islands. 
but with a chance for at least an interim stalemate if the 9th Division were sent back to anchor his defence on Okinawa. There was a faint hope this case might be different. Tokyo held firm, however, and twice reneged on promises to send replacement divisions for the 9th. Eager as Japan's de facto rulers at Imperial General Headquarters were to prompt American thoughts of negotiating an acceptable peace, they were already girding for a decisive battle at home. Orders for the dispatch of the replacement divisions were therefore countermanded, better to defend the mainland. Although field commanders like Tadashi Kojo didn't permit the loss of the 9th Division to affect their morale, higher staff officers calculated that it represented almost half the 32nd Army's fighting strength and knew its transfer was a shattering blow to the defensive plan. Some would later speculate that it was also a personal blow to Ushijima. When the 9th sailed off, he began thinking about atoning for the failure of his inevitable defeat. Flouting an unwritten rule that generals appointed their adjutants from the elite of academy graduates, he chose a rough-hewn man up from the ranks, a master swordsman who would ensure a swift, sure beheading the instant after the time would come for the general's self-disembowelment. Even now, Ushijima was utterly without illusion about his future. He remained the model commanding officer, radiating unshakable spiritual strength without the slightest outward sign of disappointment or doubt about the future. But the withdrawal of the Ninth and the refusal to replace it were unmistakable evidence that Tokyo had already conceded Okinawa and saw the coming battle as a mere delaying action. Yahara also had no illusions, even though some of the Ninth Division's weaponry remained on Okinawa, giving the 32nd Army more of it, especially artillery, than the defenders of any previous Pacific island. Still, although that would stun and dismay the American forces, it changed little in the colonel's calculations. He estimated that the attacking force as a whole would have 12 or more times the firepower of the 32nd Army, not including their air and naval support. Therefore, he scrapped his elaborate preparations for the massive counter-attack in favour of a new strategy based on his sharply reduced resources. Instead of the cherished decisive battle in which winner takes all, Yahara prepared for a war of attrition based entirely on underground sleeping tactics. Much reorganising of service, administrative and engineering units into infantry battalions had to be undertaken for the diminished defence. As units moved to new sites during their massive repositioning in December, a gigantic explosion destroyed nearly half the 32 and Army's supply of munitions. Although small quantities of supplies were still arriving by air, Japanese shipping had nearly ceased after the 1010 air raid. Now Yahara prepared a completely defensive campaign. Some staff officers calculated that a single battleship's firepower exceeded that of a full division. Knowing the enemy's control of the sea and air would give him an immeasurable advantage beyond his 12 to 1 firepower superiority on the ground, Yahara saw the sole solution as withdrawing from the bunkers above the beaches, burrowing even deeper into better fortifications inland, and waiting to engage the Americans seriously only from there. The new strategy was not only defensive but also defeatist in the sense that it provided for no more than brief counter-attacks with no hope of eventual victory. But although the great majority of Japanese lived on that hope, Yahara preferred pragmatic results to the comfort of fantasy. He had to plead his case, especially to calm the fervently aggressive Cho against the grain of the Japanese upbringing on attack and more attack, but knowing there was no way to prevent the total destruction of the 32nd Army, the realist reckoned his only goal could be to make the outcome as costly as possible, for which protection from the enemy's supreme firepower was crucial. Thus, the pace of the digging increased even more, especially since the redeployment of the remaining Japanese forces required units to abandon their laboriously constructed fortifications and begin anew. Perhaps no digger in the world could keep at it longer and more intensely, with fewer tools and less nourishment than the Japanese soldier. This was no supplementary effort to provide cover during battle, but a fundamental approach, following the single most important Japanese decision of the campaign. 
It would result in the construction of over 60 miles of tunnels as refugees for the entire 32nd Army, with all its ammunition, weapons and other supplies. The diggers were more or less comforted by the ultimate reward spelled out in a slogan composed for them. Confidence in victory will be born from strong fortifications. Knowledge that their safety would depend on their own efforts encouraged diligence. Some service units had occasional hours off to fish, drink in Okinawa's beauty, and take pleasure in the natives' kindness. The luckiest combat units had a few visits to Nahar's famous red light district, rebuilt after the 1010 raid and closely supervised by the army. Okinawan courtesans and geishas were generally reserved for officers. Korean women, some brought from Korea and the Japanese mainland as comfort girls, serviced the men in the ranks. The army had seized thousands of Korean girls, some only 12 and 13 years old, by force. Others had no time off whatever apart from a brief visit or two to houses of native volunteers. One man would remember only digging during his nine months preceding the battle. We slept on rocks and gouged rocks. We endured every conceivable suffering in a soldier's life while building our position. More months of feverish work produced new shelters, the best of which were like railroad repair tunnels, well ventilated, equipped with drainage for the sour wetness underground, and protected by a hundred feet or more of earth above. Tracks were laid for mounting heavy artillery, and entrances were camouflaged. Iwo Jima had bitterly demonstrated the Americans' skill in detecting the source of incoming fire, then destroying the gun with savage shelling from their ships, planes and artillery. Now Japanese gunners were forbidden to fire until the last minute, after which they'd quickly roll their guns back out of sight. All that was preparation for exacting the highest price for territory to be surrendered foot by foot, which is what Yahara's final operational plan amounted to. Nevertheless, he wrote and distributed a pamphlet titled The Road to Certain Victory, and Japanese soldiers remained ignorant of his strategy's underlying pessimism. Civilians, although also disturbed by the loss of the 9th Division, suspected even less as they watched their ancestral tombs converted into bunkers and saw their pastoral hillsides turned into bastions bristling with machine gun positions. Realising that battle was imminent, they shivered with their image of the enemy, although only a handful guessed there was no hope whatever of defeating him, much less that no sacrifice could do more than give the mainland more time to prepare for its Tenozan. Book 2. To distinguish it from earlier D-Days, L, Love, in American military parlance, was chosen for the April 1st landing. Nothing as grim and breathtaking had been unleashed in the history of the Pacific, Nothing similar is likely to be seen again. Most of the ships of the much-documented Normandy operation the previous June had to travel only the width of the English Channel. Operation Iceberg, an undertaking of the same immense scale, took place 6,200 miles from San Francisco, 4,000 from Pearl Harbor, and many days sailing from supply depots and anchorages the Navy had established closer to the target. The movement of mountains of goods and equipment across the Pacific's breadth, from fighter planes to millions of candy bars, was an extraordinary feat in itself, and no secondary one, since the American way of war rested on colossal quantities of supplies. The 22,000 tonnes that had been delivered daily to Iwo Jima during the fighting just ended there would be only 15% of Okinawa's daily total. Loveday's 1,457 ships and over half a million men were the consummation of a stunning exercise in military logistics. Dick Whitaker first glimpsed its magnitude after his ship's convoy joined a larger one, but still saw only a fraction of the whole. There were ships to the horizon, a truly awesome number. I couldn't have imagined that many ships existed in the world. 430 were troop ships. Their union with the largest armada ever assembled in the Pacific awed everyone aboard. The vessels had sailed from 11 ports, from Seattle to Pearl Harbor to Ulithi, an atoll 3,700 miles west of Hawaii, that provided a fine anchorage and base for forward operations, 
together with a sandy beach where Whitaker and his fellow passengers had enjoyed the luxury of an afternoon off their ship when she stopped there on her two-week passage from Guadalcanal. Although no man could see more than a sliver of the thirty square miles of ocean they covered, that was enough to bring relief that someone somewhere knew what he was doing. Getting that unbelievable number of ships with their specialised equipment and personnel to arrive all at one time at a dot in the Pacific gave us confidence. Maybe we'd be all right. I felt myself smiling inside, another Marine would remember. Maybe I'd be hit on this Okinawa where we were going, but there was no way we could lose with that incredible number of ships. The submarine fleet alone, Task Force 17, contributed over 50 vessels, some for landing advance parties to prepare the beaches. The 21st Bomber Command contributed over 300 B-29s. The aircraft carriers of Task Force 58, which would engage Yamato a week later, supplied more than 1,500 additional planes, many of which would bomb targets on Okinawa for 10 days before L-Day. The fighting ships were the largest assembly in history, over 40 carriers, 18 battleships, scores of cruisers, and almost 150 destroyers and destroyer escorts. They poured fire onto Okinawa, especially on and around the landing sites, for six full days and some of the nights. The pre-invasion bombardment by sea and air set a pattern for Japanese soldiers on the island that they'd follow until most of their deaths. As Colonel Yahara had planned, they hid underground during the day and sneaked out to do errands, later to fight, at night. Our activities begin in the evening, when the worst of the air raids are over, a survivor would record. Japanese soldiers who'd believed nothing could be worse than the air raid of the previous October 10th realised they were mistaken in January, when a series of equally powerful ones hit them day after day. Again, they believed they'd seen the worst, until the pre-invasion bombardment, which was once more surpassed on L-Day itself. In the small hours of April 1st, the support ships and 564 carrier-based aircraft began raking eight miles of Okinawan beaches, with by far the greatest bombardment in the history of the Long Pacific Campaign. Japanese likened the start of the ferocious barrage to thousands of industrial plants switching on their machinery together, but, as another soldier specified, with the magnitude of a hundred thunders striking at once. Soon the whole landing area was enveloped in smoke as if from a volcanic eruption, too heavy to make out the shore. Ten great battleships pounded it with their main batteries of 14 and 16-inch guns. Smaller broadsides from their secondary batteries and from nine cruisers, 23 destroyers and almost 200 gunships added to the enormous weight of metal. Almost 45,000 shells, plus 33,000 rockets and 22,500,000 mortar shells. Both sides felt the world was exploding. The ten battleships alone could send 120 tonnes of high explosive a minute onto Okinawa, and all sustained their ferocity for three hours, helping land some 25 rounds on every hundred square yards up to half a mile inland from the beach, which was also hit by planes, some using napalm. The smell, smoke and head-splitting noise of previous amphibious landings had been stupendous. This was more. Then it stopped, still in pre-dawn darkness. At 0406 hours, the commander of the amphibious operation gave the traditional order to land the landing force. We've all seen amphibious landings in the movies, a young naval officer whose landing ship was launching Sherman tanks in flotation collars would write home. But the real thing is more spectacular than anything I ever dreamed of. The precision bombing of the beachhead by scores of planes, the monotonous shelling of the shoreline by the huge wagons, the wave after wave of LVTs, small boats, etc. Heading into the island constituted a display so formidable and awe-inspiring, I shall never forget it. The spectacle impressed the enemy too. A Japanese soldier reported from an observation post that he couldn't make out the ocean's colour because of the enemy ships. A moment later, he conscientiously corrected himself. I take that back. It's 70% ships, 30% ocean. 
John Lardner reported the natives as somewhat bemused, nonsense prompted by ignorance of the bombarded in general and of Okinawans in particular, despite Lardner's success as a New Yorker war correspondent. They were actually full of foreboding. Since heavy American aerial reconnaissance had revealed almost nothing about the underground Japanese positions, most of the pre-landing bombardment had no specific targets. The majority of shells therefore landed randomly to obliterate civilian buildings or crater the fields of the Okinawan peasantry, as the naval historian Samuel Elliot Morrison would put it, while Okinawans wondered whether the whole island would be pulverised and blown away. The giant fleet's week of firing had been immensely more menacing than they'd expected. Their new routine too would last until the end of the campaign. Hiding and sleeping by day, the luckiest in caves, seeking sustenance and better hiding places by night. Shui Ikemiyagi, a Naha librarian now in the home guard, summed up the temper of the conscripted natives, who continued hoping for the promised Japanese victory, and that it wouldn't cost them everything. Most men in his generally gloomy and miserable cave wondered whether the imminent landing would bring their deaths. Some cried themselves to sleep, worrying about their families. Most Japanese soldiers were distinctly tougher, full of apprehension, wrote an artillerist whose heavy gun was hidden deep in a hill and camouflaged with branches. But it was mixed with eager expectation that swelled our chests. It was a tribute to their training, bravery and supreme commitment that the sight of the enemy armada, while impressing them with its size and impudence for steaming so nonchalantly into Japanese waters, neither seized them with fear nor informed them of the battle's inevitable end. The same training, implemented amid the national hypnosis, was also what blinded virtually all to how Japan's war had been ravaging others and why it couldn't possibly be won blinded them even to evidence before their eyes, for many gazed with satisfaction at the immensely powerful fleet. So many enemy vessels gathered for convenient destruction by imperial planes and warships. The spectacle was so massively more violent than anything the Americans had seen that most had moments of intense exhilaration. The smoke, smell and thunder of naval salvo after ear-splitting salvo were stupefying. To a man waiting for the order to enter his landing boat, just the din of brass shell cases clattering on one ship's steel deck deafened, like a thousand cymbals falling down stone steps. But the troops readying themselves to climb down the nets to the boats would have been happy to tolerate ten times worse. The first 24 hours on Iwo Jima six weeks earlier had cost 5,500 American casualties, the average casualty rate of Pacific landings was over three times greater than in the European fighting. More were expected on Okinawa, whose strategically more valuable territory was a third closer to the mainland and also a Japanese prefecture, rather than merely a possession. Rumour correctly had it that intelligence predicted L-Day casualties of 80 to 85 per cent, for which extra medical teams were going in with the first waves. Those troops were therefore grateful for every bomb, bullet and rocket of the heaviest ever bombardment in support of an amphibious landing. Shouldering their weapons and backpacks, the infantrymen pulled themselves over the side, many carrying a hundred pounds of supplies and equipment. Sailors watched with a combination of camaraderie and relief that they didn't have to join them. You bet I felt sorry for them, a twenty-year-old carpenter's mate on a repair ship would remember. They didn't show fear, but how could they not have had it? As the huge roar of amphibious craft engines joined the gunfire thunder, sweat broke out on drawn faces. Even veterans of previous landings fought terror, or especially such veterans. This was John McMullen's fifth, so I figured this had to be my time to get it. I'd been too lucky so far. I don't know the words to explain how it is to be in combat, another veteran would later apologise. I was afraid, frightened and scared each time we jumped off the landing boats, and another. For myself, I must confess that from chow at 3am till I climbed into the landing craft, it seemed I'd explode from severe nervous tension. April 1st was Ed Jones's birthday. I knew about Ewo. I thought I might have a very short 19th year. Still, 
Fear was only one of the emotions gripping the men as they squeezed into the bobbing landing boats and breathed their oily exhaust. Another was relief to leave the motherships. Whitaker's crossing from the States to his Russell Island staging area, then to Guadalcanal and Okinawa, was typical. In San Diego, he'd been packed into a Liberty troop ship for a voyage whose first leg alone took a month. Steel decks turned scorching under the equatorial sun. The hastily built or converted tubs with their troughs for latrines were torture for men squeezed together in the reek of sweat, urine and vomit. You wouldn't treat sardines that way, a deck officer reckoned. Many troops preferred landing to fight the devil himself, and surely the devilish Japanese, to spending another 24 hours in buckets whose gagging conditions grew worse on the final leg to Okinawa, when the fringe of a typhoon made their lower decks a fetid mess. Most Elde breakfasts had been the traditional pre-landing feast of steak and eggs, all they could eat. But many men could manage only a few mouthfuls. At three or four o'clock in the morning, with the thunder of the naval guns reminding them that many would die during the next few hours, it was too much like a convict's last meal. Some cocky teenagers without wives and children to cherish were impatient. Even without the torment of the voyage, as Paul Fussell pointed out, combat's compensations, the thrill of comradeship, the excitements of the chase, the exhilarations of surprise, deception and the ruse de guerre, the exaltations of success, the sheer fun of prankish irresponsibility. Console young men more than older ones. And although sheer fun would be rare on Okinawa, older men shared with teenagers confidence in their training and certainty of victory. Deep pride in belonging to their units and an almost bodily satisfaction of righteous unity fed eagerness for the battle that was simultaneously feared. A mess sergeant in a tank battalion had paid $50 to his first sergeant in order not to miss the fighting, because he'd otherwise be stuck in his rear echelon unit on Guam. A more impoverished buddy of his stowed away in order to be with his unit and was later court-martialed for his initiative. After training endlessly for combat and absorbing all the indoctrination that went with it, not to join their buddies facing the test would have been a terrible letdown as well as a lucky break. Fear that one's arms and legs might be among those soon to be blown off was usually surpassed by fear of failing in the eyes of the others. That had been the ultimate purpose of their training, to make them perceive the danger as less fearsome than the alternatives. An infantryman preparing to land in the first wave would later speak for almost everyone alongside him. I think my biggest fear wasn't of getting hurt because, like everybody else, until he's been in the line for weeks and knows that's pure bullshit, I was certain that's what happens to the other guys. This is crazy, but my biggest fear was whether the guy alongside me could tell what was happening in my stomach and whether I'd do something shameful when we hit the beach. I joined up to fight Japs and be a hero, but will I have what it takes? A friend added. I was scared out of my mind, but also scared that the guy next to me would see that. So the fear was private. Shared, but also covered up. I wasn't just tense, I was scared half dizzy, a young infantryman would remember. But even more than that, I was determined that nobody would see I was worried about anything. The main thing was not to show your buddy how frightened you were. You prayed you wouldn't panic, another added. You hoped like hell your landing craft would somehow never reach the beach, yet also hoped it was already there so you could get it over with. And most important, you'd been trained never to let your buddies down. You knew how terrible that would be. So your fear of getting killed wasn't as bad as having to spend the rest of your life with your tail between your legs if you did let them down, a failure, a coward. Buck Private Thomas Hanaher felt dumb, dumb, dumb for having voluntarily surrendered his asthma-caused 4F draft classification with the neat lie at his second medical examination in North Dakota and choosing the Marines on top of that. Dumb, dumb, dumb one of the stupidest things I've done in my life. Because you knew this would probably be even worse than Iwo. You knew you'd be a casualty soon. That was just the law of averages. But although Hanaher realised that day might be his last, another part of him knew that was impossible. Resolution grappled with self-pity. 
Why did he have to be there now? Nevertheless, he wanted to do his job. He still had to prove himself, and what better way? I was scared as hell, but also proud to be with those going into combat. I was going to do this thing, and if I got through it, which I doubted, maybe life would be different when I got home. Love of country was a given. All felt uplifted by belonging to their blessed righteous homeland, but flag and country became abstract as the dawn approached. What now held mind and body together was a sense of duty to one's buddies squeezed in all around, and the unwillingness to lose face in their eyes. On shore, an Okinawan conscript who felt the cannonade compressed the hearts of Japanese soldiers with its elaborate cacophony, now watched the troop transport spew forth small boats whose splendid formations traced white wakes in their arrow-like flight to the beach. Combat had offered no similar spectacle since the mass charges of the French knights in the Hundred Years' War, the American historians James and William Belot would write. Here was the finest moment in the history of amphibious operations, an almost unbroken line of landing craft eight miles long simultaneously approaching one beach. Perhaps fear accounts for the discrepancy in memories of the weather that morning. Some would remember an overcast sky and choppy waves, others a glorious sunrise appearing above the hills and casting a glow over a tranquil East China Sea. One man saw a change from one to the other, reading into it the divine intervention for which all but the determinedly atheist were praying, just as Japanese were simultaneously praying for intervention on their side remembering the divine wind that had helped defeat the seemingly all-powerful Mongols. American believers were comforted by the knowledge that April 1st happened to be Easter Sunday. Even the sea changed from a raging turbulence to a peaceful lapping water, a marine gratefully observed. It was as though God came on Easter Sunday to lay everything in readiness before us. Trained to dig in for protection, the infantrymen felt vulnerable and helpless in their thousand-odd landing craft. In the tension, few remembered the small gunboats that had led the way, blanketing the beach to the last moment with shells, rockets and mortars. But the memory of the landing itself would be universally joyous. American intelligence hadn't even guessed that the landings would be virtually unopposed, even by artillery for Japanese gunners had been ordered not to fire on the ships or landing craft for fear of revealing their positions and exposing them to devastating return fire. The Yahara Ushijima strategy was still to delay all serious resistance for a better time and place. American aerial photographs had pinpointed some of the menacing fortifications constructed above the landing beaches, but didn't reveal that almost all were abandoned. Captain Kojo's battalion, for example, had been withdrawn more than three months earlier, shortly after Ushijima lost the 9th Division. Nor did the photos disclose the quality of the replacements for the highly trained 24th Division. The single regiment now protecting the beaches was composed of hastily organised service troops, chiefly airfield construction crews, reinforced by ill-trained, half-armed Okinawan Home Guard units. The relief of the American brass was expressed in a radio message from Admiral Richmond Turner, commander of the landing operation, to his boss, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet. Practically no fire against landing boats, none against ships, troops advancing standing up. The even greater relief of those making the swift advance turned from an immense sense of deliverance to the bafflement recorded in the battle diary of Taylor Kennelly, the leader of a machine gun platoon, Japanese soldiers were no less baffled. Believing their combined fleet to be intact and their planes lying in wait on the mainland and Formosa, they thought it simply incredible that the American fleet was operating in broad daylight right before their noses. Looking at the fascinatingly beautiful battleships spitting fire, we still couldn't quite understand that they'd come to kill us. Through the dense clouds of smoke and dust left by the bombardment, they watched the landing in disbelief and confusion. A soldier assigned to defend the beach hurried to tell a friend positioned in a school two miles inland that his little unit had somehow survived the ten days of relentless bombing. How tenaciously they cling to life, marvelled the friend. But the clinging was almost over. 
The entire unit at the landing site, including the member who immediately returned there, would be dead by mid-morning. Thus the operation became something of an exercise. Dashing anxiously from his landing craft, one Marine saw an earlier arrival flipping through a comic book. American fear shifted to amazement and jubilation all along the eight miles of beaches on the western East China Sea shore. Remembering his wounding on Guam, a young company commander named Owen Stebbins felt an inner joy that he was still in one piece. Other veterans of previous landings wondered where and when the Japanese would spring their trap. April 1st was April Fool's Day as well as Easter Sunday. I've already lived longer than I thought I would, exulted an army infantryman after running up the beach and making it to the top of a little hill. The opposition wasn't worse than at Iwo Jima, as expected. It was limited to occasional mortar shells and snipers' bullets, relatively no resistance at all.